Hello everybody, and welcome once again to B-Movie Euphoria's VHS Roulette. Um, I'm here, Nick, yet again, to introduce to you another movie that has slipped through the cracks, that no one cares about, uh, that, you know, wasn't really well received when it came out, maybe isn't so good, but uh, <laughs> I hope to find films. That's my the whole purpose behind these videos is finding films that were just kind of overlooked and maybe deserve a second look every once in a while okay a lot of times i get movies that there's a reason that they didn't get any farther than uh uh crappy video release but today i think i found something a little special and I want to share it with y'all, because it's up for free on YouTube, and you can watch the whole thing right now. And, I mean, it's a decent movie length, 105 minutes. Uh, why are movies becoming so long? Like, every movie I go to see now, in the theaters, it's it has to be over two hours. So when did we decide that movies have to be over two hours? I thought like an hour 30 that was the standard at least when i was growing up and then suddenly like if you wanted to make a good movie or a powerful movie it had to be two hours i'm like i got i got other things to do everybody does and they're wondering why people are not going to the theaters as much shorten your movies okay avengers great there's there's fucking five of them. You don't need each one to be two and a half hours long. I think this started with the Lord of the Rings movies, where Peter Jackson was just releasing them as over two goddamn hours long. And I can't... Maybe this is a personal thing, but I can't watch that much of that goofy shit. Like, it's fun and everything, and dwarves, and... Um, Harry Potter's running around, but I can't sit and watch that shit for that long. And same goes with really anything. Um, just shorten your movies, guys. Come on. Just shorten them. You know? Anyway, today's movie is... The Rune Stone. Um, and uh, I, most of you might re recognize this guy right here. Because he was one of the henchmen, villains, whatever you call them, in The Die Hard. If you uh, remember that movie at all, he was the guy, uh, I think his brother got killed. Uh, he was, his brother was the guy that, you know, John McClane wrote, Now I have a machine gun. Ho, ho, ho. And then he got really pissed off. And then him and John McClane have a big fight, and then John McClane basically hangs him with a chain. And then uh, at the very end of the movie, after hanging for, you know, hours, um, he comes back to life, and... Ah! Great kind of um, out-of-nowhere scare in the Die Hard. But he's also been in other stuff. Uh, I've seen him throughout, like, 80s films, and maybe some 90s films. I think he's... I might be getting this wrong, but I think he's a professional dancer. And um, he, you can tell because he's very svelte and he, the way he moves and everything. I don't know why they put him on the cover of this film. He does... Like, he plays a, an important role. I'm not saying he doesn't. But he's really only in it for, like, the last... 10, 15 minutes. And his... His character is, I mean, integral, but he kind of just walks around and says things that I can't fucking understand. Like... He's, his English isn't great, and they're giving him complex lines to say, like a lot of exposition and stuff like that, and... I'm just like, what? Hey. Um, but anyway, let's get to the film itself. 
uh, in the film we have uh, Martin Almquist is searching some mines uh, and comes across so, this big ancient stone with carvings in it called runes. I'm not going to get into runes because I don't know what they are really. Uh, I have an ex-wife that was into runes and all that, but eh, it, it, they don't give you a lot of stuff. Basically, it's you know Norse uh, like mythology and the Vikings. Basically, in the movie, they're saying the the Vikings came to the U.S., dropped off this big stone because there was something evil in it. That's what they give us. Anyway, so Martin, who's an archaeologist, takes this stone back to his, um, like, display pad. At first I thought it was a museum because there are all these stones and different kinds of um, ancient things in this big room, so I was like, oh, it's a museum. And then they were saying it's on the 44th floor of this huge building, and I'm like, Okay, so it's just his private collection. I don't know. But, uh, so he finds this thing. He's very interested in it. And uh, so he calls up his ex-girlfriend, Marla, and uh, her new boyfriend, Sam, who are working on another site for some other stuff. He's like, hey, Marla, found some cool stuff. Come on over. Okay, bye. And uh, then the giant rock is transported to this building, uh, Martin's office, I guess, I, whatever it is, and immediately uh, there's this whole scene with a U-Haul. Like, U-Haul must have put some money into this, but uh, there's very dramatic music with this U-Haul driving down the road and then delivering it to, uh, you know, the warehouse or whatever of this building, and it's like, Duh! Dun, 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 dun. And nothing's really happening. It's just a U-Haul driving down a road. Anyway, so uh, the guys drop it off to a couple of uh, archaeologist um, assistants wearing lab coats. And they take it up an elevator, only to have the elevator woof, come crashing down. Boof, the, everybody's dead. Boof, the delivery guys come up. One of them goes... Jesus Christ! And then, you know, runs off. Um, so after that, we go into, we meet some other characters. So, so far we have Martin, the archaeologist who brought the stone back. We got Sam and Marla who are coming to this building to check out the stone. And now we have uh, young Jacob who... Uh, his father is dying, um, and his father has this friend named Hagstrom, who's talking about, obviously, the stone and the evil behind it and everything, and, the, and Jacob's like, nah, man, it's just a bunch of crazy stuff. So you know that this kid's going to come back and, you know, help save the day somehow. Because he's the, f the only, like, attractive young kid in the movie, so you're like, oh, he's got to have something to do with it. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so the stone, after, you know, the elevator mishap, ends up in Martin's display area, and Martin's looking at it, and he's hearing all these voices and crazy shit, and uh, he's touching it, and then he... Oh, oh, and he cuts his fingy on it, and um, then he, 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 that's the end of the scene, basically. Um, we're also seeing a lot of flashes um, throughout when we're hearing the voices and the stone and Martin. We're seeing a lot of flashes of our friend here. And he's, we're shown that he's a clockmaker. He's working on clocks with a young boy. What's going on? And... Uh, uh, and then we're seeing flashes of some sort of creature that's walking around this dark, foggy hellscape. Uh, huge, giant, like, feet, claw hands, big hairy back. Um, so we're seeing all that kind of mixed together. 
and then we flash to an art party. So I guess Martin's also involved in uh, the arts, and so there's this huge art installation, which is basically this big building with all the walls painted. Everybody's in, like, really um, fancy dress, you know, tuxes and ladies are in great dresses, but at the same time, everyone's smashing the walls with sledgehammers. So, uh, <laughs> it actually kind of, um, there's a lot of weird art world stuff in this movie, which reminded me a lot of the recent Netflix movie, um, Velvet Buzzsaw. It's just, uh, because I, I, I always love that in movies where they go to, like, some art gallery and the art is just so outlandish and so like pompous and ridiculous <clears throat> um because i i love the art world but it is it's just ready to be parodied <laughs> parodied parodied constantly because i mean art can be pretentious art can be ridiculous and sometimes it deserves a kick in the ass anyway so while he's there, while Martin's there, checking out, you know, the painted walls that look like a three-year-old painted them, and these people in really expensive suits smashing the walls with sledgehammers, he ends up picking up a sledgehammer, hearing the voices again like a crazy person, starts smashing the walls, and um, we know something's going on. Anyway, <clears throat> so Marla and Sam show up, and they realize that... Um, He's acting kind of weird, and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, ah, and, um, so, they, uh, he keeps getting weirder and weirder, and then out of nowhere, late at night, um, they're all about to leave, Marlon and Sam, and Martin, Martin's like, no, I gotta go back to get my keys, whoops, be right back, he goes up to the building, and then the security guard of, you know, the 44th floor starts hearing uh, and sends his buddy. His buddy gets killed. Um, that security guard gets killed. It's just, it starts being a bloodbath. And this is when the movie starts getting really interesting. Because we got a huge super beast that looks pretty good. It's like a mixture of an insane ape and a bear and like a dog face. It's like a werewolf um, monkey bear. And uh, it's pretty freaky looking. And it's, I mean, sometimes you look at it and it's just like, it looks just like a big old mask, but sometimes it's moving like it's. And it looks pretty good. So for the majority, it's it's pretty great. So a bunch of people are killed on the 44th floor. And uh, so the cops come, obviously, and we meet our detective, uh, Fanducci. And Fanducci is played by Peter Riger, who most people would recognize him from his role in The Mask, which he played the detective in that one. He's basically playing the same character <laughs> Um, from the mask in this movie, uh, just because he's kind of goofy, uh, he swears a lot, um, and is just popping Pez constantly. So his character, it's, I love it when a movie knows that it's pretty ridiculous and pretty over the top, so let's just throw in a character in there that's gonna make us all relaxed and not have to worry about, you know, the seriousness of people's heads being ripped off and being disemboweled. So Fanducci comes, and uh, it, it, the movie just gets better and better. We get a lot more uh, monster ripping people apart. We get Fanducci, like, trying to help Marla and Sam, because now this beast uh, that was once Martin is coming after them. And we get Lawrence Tierney. So if you don't know who Lawrence Tierney is, he was uh, a big actor way back in the day. But uh, you guys might know him most from Reservoir Dogs, where he plays basically the guy that sets up 
the job, and he's the guy that's like, you're Mr. Bland, you're Mr. <laughs> you're Mr. Green, you're Mr. Brown, you're Mr. Pink. So that guy. And he is really, really good in this as the um, police chief, or Fanducci's boss. And uh, he's just hilarious. Uh, like, every line he says is just amazing. I have, <laughs> I have one of them here. And, uh, oh, one of Fanducci's, my favorite Fanducci line is, uh, he's popping Pez, and he's like, the girl yells at him for swearing too much, and Fanducci just goes, Ah, I'm sorry about that. You want a Pez? Greatest fucking candy in the world. It's it's definitely not, by the way. Um, shit, I can't remember. Basically, he's like, he doesn't believe them, even after they've all seen the huge werewolf guy, and he's like, it's just a big fucking guy in a bulletproof dog suit. And uh, so it's... Uh, it's pretty wacko. This whole film is is wild. Finally, um, after the Beast has killed, like, another ten people at another art gallery, this one, um, they're all, like, the frames are all on the wall, but they're all, like, live-action things happening behind the frames, like a woman ironing laundry and everything, and people just, like, standing still. And so another, you know, pretentious art gallery, but... El Bisto shows up, clawing at people, ripping the shit out of everybody. Excellent scene. Um, after that happens, um, the police are, are basically like, fuck, this is some serious shit's going on. So Clockmaker dude shows up, and he's like, he says a bunch of stuff which I could barely hear, and I do not, I did not understand, but basically he goes to Lawrence Tierney, the police chief, and he's like, I've, you know, the blood of the, I need a hundred men. And Lawrence Tierney's like, I'm not giving you anything, you son of a bitch. And then this guy just stares at him, just stares at him. And then all of a sudden, like five seconds later, Lawrence Tierney's like, I'll give you whatever you want. And so they set up a big trap for big, stinky, um, Cujo Bigfoot, and uh, <laughs> it's back at the 44th floor because, you know, they didn't have a lot of sets in this movie. But it actually looks good. Okay, the movie looks like it cost more than it probably did. Um, there's a great... The scene at the end, basically the whole end is great. It's filled with, like, big old hairy monster action, and... Young Jacob is told by his father that he has to uh, bust this sacred axe out of a work of art, which, um, you know, you just kind of go with it. At one point, there's an incredible, incredible scene between uh, Mr. Die Hard here and young Jacob where they are both chopping at the beast with the sacred axe, like, whack, whack, whack. And then he passes it over to Die Hard Guy, and then he's like whacking at him. And at one point, um, the clockmaker, diehard man, passes the axe through the beast's body <laughs> and passes it to Jacob. And Jacob grabs the axe and then starts whacking him on the other side. And wow, that was. Woo! Anyway, this is a really fun movie. I really recommend this one. Check it out on YouTube. I'll put the link up there. Um, Thanks again for watching B-Movie Euphoria's VHS Roulette. Be well, live well, live happy. Okay? Bye-bye.